All right, so our first presenter after lunch is Stacy Mason. She's the senior breeder field representative for AKC or American Kennel Club. And she will be talking today about preparing and acclimating dogs for transportation. Please give a warm welcome for Stacy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming back from lunch. I appreciate that both online and in person. Um, I'm really excited about being here um, because transportation has come up a lot in my life in the last uh, almost 20 years. I work for the American club and I've had this position for about 19 and a half years February will be 20 I'm pretty excited about it I've seen some major major changes in the dog world uh, during that time you can read my bio for some of the details but um, you know I've seen I've, I've worked with some working dogs we've got some working dog people in here I've worked with some dog breeders I've worked with some pet stores um, I've had some experience with some of the AZA people. I actually, uh, before I hired on as a police officer years ago, I retired from that. But uh, before I hired on that, I was actually hired at the Oklahoma City Zoo and uh, I had to make a choice. And I went with the law enforcement uh, position and, and it has served me well and, and moved me into the position that I have held today. But with that said, my supervisors, they know that I haven't worked in the last 19 and a half years, so don't tell payroll. Uh, I absolutely love my job. I feel like I'm in the place where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So hopefully um, I'll be able to share some information today that um, I'm going to ask you guys uh, a, a couple of things. I'm going to share a couple of mottos with you. Um, I want to thank USDA for having me. And I also want to thank the speakers that were here uh, previous to me for a lot of your really good points because you also, just like Chad said, you stole my thunder on some of them. So, um, but I do want to share a few mottos that I've always put out there as part of my life. Um, the slides are also back there at the back. If you want to get one of those, they can pass them around. If you want to hold your hand up, they'll bring them to you. Um, but for a couple of mottos, I just, and they're not in the handout, but um, my favorite motto that uh, I made up and lived by in my department, it's kind of my uh, unofficial creed, is to make a difference in dogs' lives and the people's lives they touch. And so I, hopefully that's what I'm doing in my job um, today here with you guys as well. And uh, some of the information, it's, it's going to be very applicable to what you've already talked about with your marine animals and preparing them to get ready for the next step and preparing them for that transport. So some of this is gonna be very basic for somebody like you, but if you will remind those transporters you come in contact with, or if you are a transporter, the breeders you come in contact with, or the rescue groups you're coming in contact with, and those people that you're touching, some of the stuff that um, I will share, hopefully it'll make their life a little easier and it'll make the difference in those dogs' lives. So the other thing is uh, I'm gonna share the AKC motto is that we're more than champion dogs, we're the dog's champion. And like today, education is the key. Thomas Jefferson did say that one. Um, Giovanni Trevano said, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. My dad taught me that from the time I was a little tiny kid. And um, Zig Ziglar said success is met with preparedness. And this is another one that I kind of throw out here from time to time. I, I, I said, I don't know that anybody said it before me, but through individual communication and education, ICE, I-C-E, individual communication and education, barriers between all groups will melt. And so with that said, this is a unique situation here today. Unique online, all the people that are attending, all the groups getting together. And sometimes, you know, we look at each other from the other side of the fence and we think we're at odds, but we're all here today for the welfare of our animals and those in our care and those that we'll be working with. So love your neighbors, you love yourself. And if you're not part of the solution, you're the problem, but every problem has a solution. So thank you for being here and thank you for listening to me. So let's get started here. All right. So I think I gave all my background and thank you for everybody's coming. But my topic today is um, 
about acclimating animals and particularly dogs and puppies to get them ready for transportation. So you saw some of the, those crate pictures that Bob put up there earlier. They were kind of ugly, weren't they? Not good. You saw also some of the uh, pictures that Alan had of the dogs crammed into the carriers and not real comfortable. That doesn't make an animal real happy, lots of stress. And uh, like they said earlier, um, Chad wanted, it's not just enough to arrive alive. Um, we want them to arrive healthy, happy, safe, and prepared for future. We don't want a crate experience to be so traumatic that that dog won't stay in a crate if the owner travels with it and it has to be put in a crate at the hotel, or if they have to leave it for a few minutes, um, you know, at the doggy daycare, or it has to board. We don't want those animals so traumatized from a transportation episode um, that it's going to affect the well-being of that animal throughout its entire life. Um, zoo animals, you know, they have enclosures, they have some space that they can, and they're not having to physically interact with humans like most of our dogs and puppies are in people's beds. So when we have those things going on, and it's going to not just affect those dogs' life for anywhere from a eh, large giant breed, 8, 10, 12, 14 years, um, my last Italian Greyhound, um, I lost her a few years back and she was 22 years old. So to live with a dog that long, if it's not happy or comfortable and in your space, it does make a difference sometimes. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we make happy happen for some of these dogs and animals. So uh, what the ultimate goal is that we want to have happy customers. We want to have a, a happy dog or puppy arrive on the end of that transportation. We want somebody who is um, uh, happy that the dog arrived alive and it didn't get sick and pass away within fi a five day window because of biosecurity reasons weren't followed during transportation and that that dog was maybe fine when it went to the vet, was four or five days in transit and COVID, uh, we already talked about, um, I think um, Alan mentioned the numbers that have gone up for registrants for transporta T transportation uh, registrations during uh, COVID and since 2020. That number has gone staggering. And so we've got to share our knowledge with those people and, think, and maybe they're not here in this room, but maybe they're here online, maybe they'll watch it later to work on biosecurity as well. That's what helps happy happen also in transportation. So um, knowing the transportation rules for your dogs and your animals, just like uh, doc, uh, Dr. Dole said earlier, um, I, I had no idea that a marine mammal needed to be that cool in transportation to be happy. I'm not the mammal per the the marine person. So knowing the acclimation for these animals and getting them ready for that transportation and knowing what your USDA regulation is does make a difference. So one of the best things I got to do in making this presentation was I got to find some really cute puppy pictures online and through our database. So look at that little guy, his body language. Look at that body language. How many animal behaviorists do I have in here? Do I have any behaviorists in here? Two or three, okay. So that's really cool. That dog's body language, what's he telling? His ears are forward, his eyes are bright, his mouth is soft. You can see the little upturned uh, edges of his mouth. That dog's smiling, right? Let's give him some, no, let's not give him any human behaviors, but that's what his body language is saying. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about weaning, vaccination, deworming, bathing, grooming, doing nails, vet checks, separations from litter mates, new smells, unfamiliar places and people and changes in food and water and how this can affect um, whether the dog uh, is stressed or not. And so these things can affect these dogs and puppies. And um, one of the things I want you guys to know is that stress is one of the things that, what does it first affect? Our gut, when we get sick and we start feeling bad, 
we don't have to look to the science. There is science out there that says if you get stressed, you get ulcers, you get ulcers, you get sick, and it just kind of goes downhill for that. So it, it also is out there, the science is out there for dogs, but let's just talk about this in our dogs and transport. If the dog gets stressed, it's going to affect its gut, which is gonna affect the transport, which is gonna affect the health of that puppy, when it arrives, how it arrives, where it arrives, and what's happening during that whole transportation. So um, the immune system um, is, a lot of veterinarians in here, you guys know that the immune system, if the gut gets affected, that's gonna affect other um, endocrine systems and everything else. So let's prepare to acclimate the dogs for puppies for transportation and it, it help create less stress in their lives. And so we want happy to happen. So how do we do that if we're dog breeders or transporters for a dog breeder or an airline who is dealing with these customers at the counter? What can we do to help make that transportation happen? So what I want to do is to make your life less stress and not more work, but more fun. So let's talk about some of the crate training and the things that are gonna happen before the trip. So if I take a puppy that has woke up this morning, I give him a bath at three o'clock in the morning and I do his toenails, he's never been woke up that early. I then suddenly cram him into a crate. I drive him across two or three hours. I get him to the airport. He's now a drooly mess. So why did I even bother giving him the bath? And he's maybe vomited in the crate two or three times. Now I've got my paper towels. I'm out in your parking lot, throwing them on the ground and doing biosecurity problems for other people that, that are coming to transport their dogs as well. And this dog is not happy. It's, it's already upset and it's already stressed. And then how many people here work at the airport counter or has been, yeah. And, and now you've got a puppy that's laying in there um, you get to listen to it for the next, what did we say, four to six hours, not preferably more than four. Somebody said that earlier in their presentation, but at least two hours in advance, you're hearing, ah, 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 okay, and not just that one puppy, but many puppies, okay, so if I can do that and release and get some quiet in your life and less stress in your life, I wanna help you do that as well. So let's talk about before the toenails, before the blow drying, how can we acclimatize these dogs to some of this before all of that happens? So um, we're gonna do some fun things with the dogs, just like they're doing with, I, I, he was talking this morning, I kept on thinking of a video I had seen on an elephant learning to uh, get its toenails trimmed, okay? And the training that went into that and a couple of the zoos that I've been to and seen some of the behavior stuff going on with all of that. So a lot of the stuff I'm gonna just touch on just really hasn't been talked about in the dog world, but it has been in the zoo world. So we wanna make sure that we're doing it as stress-free as we can. When you give a bath, they've got these new little Lixit mats that you can stick it to the wall in the bathtub and put peanut butter on it. I like cream cheese, um, but you know, it almost never stays up there. So I just, they've got peanut butter now in a squeeze tube. It's the best thing ever. And I just smear it on the wall when I'm giving the puppy a bath. And when I'm giving pills, I'm giving you know, in peanut butter. I'm I, So that they lick it off my finger or in cream cheese or in squeeze cheese, the cheese in a can. Because these are fun things and it makes the dogs learn that human animal bond and it helps them to um, uh, not uh, be stressed and they start learning to like some of these things. So how many times the, the first day they're gonna get on the airplane and come to you guys, they have just had their toenails done for the first time. I can go to Walmart or any other dollar store and buy a little toothbrush that has battery operated double triple a batteries in it and turn a toothbrush on and puppies when they're still in the whelping back box uh, touch their feet zzz, zzz, with that little noise making toothbrush it's not doing anything to them but it's associating the sound and the noise with the puppies and the what's happening and then if you do it individually um, in my breeder world, um, Dr. Carmen Battaglia, um, he's uh, been, been a great person who's talked about um, a lot of the um, uh, 
biosensor and help the US military working dogs develop um, early neurological stimulation for puppies and the timeframes for that to happen. We've got dog breeders who, all over the country who are doing that now. But it's really cool to also see them now doing toothbrushes on the puppy's feet, trying to get those puppies uh, used to the, um, um, the noise and the, 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 the sight, the smells of those types of things. So brushing them before it ever happens, you can actually take a clipper with no blade on it and sit in the whelping box and turn it on move it over the puppy and then do the clipping the day or two prior to bathing so that they're not getting all in one day at one time. And vaccinations and dewormings is another thing that we see that can be a problem because you've got to have the correct timing that your veterinarian says as to when you need to deworm and when you need to vaccinate. But you know, you can't do it all in the same day at the same time. And we've all recently experienced flu shots, COVID shots. Some of us got sick, some of us didn't. Some of us felt bad after them. Some of us didn't even notice that we had had something. Puppies are the same way. If you vaccinate them today and you're transporting them tomorrow, chances are that little guy's gonna feel icky. And if they feel icky, they're stressed. If they're stressed, they're not gonna feel good during transport. How is your, are you guys as a transporter gonna know that puppy is feeling good or bad when it's already, okay, yeah, you got your health checked three days ago, but, and it was fine then, but if you vaccinate, you know, you really got to pay attention to your timing, talk to your veterinarian about that. So, and it's also about making that fun. Um, a few of you guys um, in the room may know Dr. Marty Greer, a veterinarian out of Wisconsin. Um, she's also an overachiever and a lawyer. Um, but she, she's kind of a wonderful, fun person to hear talk. Uh, she also uh, works for uh, a couple companies, other companies as well. But she, uh, I had the pleasure and privilege of shadowing her at her veterinarian practice one day. And in came a lady with a little Vizsla puppy. And she was like, oh my goodness. And it was there for its very first, second set of vaccines since the lady had it. And she's like, oh my goodness. And she takes the little puppy. And in the minute, Dr. Marty is in the floor rolling around with this puppy. That puppy had had a fecal probe, been dewormed and had its vaccination and ate a cookie and had the best day of its life. And it didn't even know it was at the veterinarian. That is a puppy that is going to remember its entire life the veterinarian is cool. I like going to that place. And so these are things that we need to do with our puppies. When we're giving pills, like I said earlier, we're going to make sure that, it, that we're giving them in peanut butter or cream cheese. And we're not poking and fighting and wrestling to give those things. We want these experiences fun and less stress. So we're also going to think about things like gut health. I mentioned gut health a while ago. Um, if you're not using some of the probiotics, um, this is one of those, uh, uh, some of the science, there's the links on the, on the handouts uh, for the uh, Fortiflora. Um, this has got some scientific evidence behind it that is really kind of fun. Um, they've also done some feed trials uh, with puppies in transit that were flying, um, especially during COVID. So that I think that uh, if you start this product um, a couple of weeks before the puppy, or a week, at least a week before the puppy goes in transit, and then the puppy owner has some of it on hand when the puppy gets there, uh, or if, if you're using it in your transport businesses, I think it's something to consider it, it, to look at. The uh, bedding and housing, and, and like I said, I don't wanna make people's jobs harder, I wanna make their, them easier. So what this picture is, is you know a kind of a typical kennel setup. I do realize that these are wire crates, not shipping crates, but this was a great picture. If you look at this, these little guys right here, this is a litter box, okay? And this little guy is over here to do his business. There's a little puppy over here asleep in this kennel. And there's one over here doing something. And these guys look like they're having dinner and this one's over here drinking, okay? So what I see in that picture right there is a lot less work for a dog breeder because the puppies are becoming what we call latrinal. 
and holding it to go to potty over here. They're also learning that I eat or drink and then I go over here. And these are still doing group feedings. As the puppies are a little older, um, and I'd probably be doing it at this age with this litter of Dalmatians already, I would be separating them into twos and th or twos or ones into the crates and feeding them in the crates and shutting the door while they're eating. Because if you're doing something like that, that puppy is learning crate training. It is learning this is a safe place. It is learning this is where I wanna eat, that I can get something to drink, and then you let the puppy out. And you just gotta remember that anytime puppies eat, drink, sleep, or play, they, need to, they will need to eliminate. So we'll need to pay attention to that. So let's take a look at this next one. Uh, we want them familiar with smells and items, okay? Um, we wanna be very careful the bedding that you're putting inside the kennels and crates that it is an absorbent material that they can't choke on, that's not gonna cause a bowel obstruction, and it's not something they're gonna tear up. If you go back, if I go back to that picture right there, um, it, right here in the crates, oops, 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 oops I'm, I'm all over the place now. If you look here in the crate right here, it's got one of those um, uh, temporary disposable uh, wee wee pads for dogs. And the, I think there's probably one up there also for whatever reason to put into the crate and get it ready. But um, I don't like those because those can cause bowel obstructions. When, when I've, I've seen a few puppies eat those or dogs eat those and tear them up. And the cloth or fabric ones tend to be a little more user friendly. There used to be a product that was called Second Nature um, that was specifically made for dogs for litter box training and stuff like that. I, I used to love that product. They've now got several other products that are safe for dogs that are for litter box training or that can be put in the bottom of the crate. Um, some, some transporters you'll see uh, they like the shredded paper. Um, like you saw in one of Bob's pictures earlier that the little Yorkie was hiding behind. Um, and, and that tends to be pretty absorbable. They don't tend to eat it. Um, uh, the problem with that is the long strands, if you get them in the really long strands, watch puppies, but they're not getting it started in their mouth. It's kind of like a piece of fishing line or a piece of hair or something. They can't break it off or get it if, if it if it gets in their mouth sometimes. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, I see them using the shorter strands that are not too long. And even if they did get it in their mouth a little bit, it is going to just come right through. It's not going to hurt something and it would become disposed. So it's not something that's uh, too much to, to worry about as far as that. But think about the scents and the smells that you're putting in the crate with the puppies. Um, those beds, if you wash them, that you're going to transport a puppy with a bedding. Um, the maybe some lavender oils or something that you use around the crates or in the crates or calming oil. Those are some things that um, we see that um, can be just misted over the crate, get used to the smell while it's there at home, while the puppies are learning, while they're still in the litter and whelping boxes. So um, let's look at some um, uh, other options. If you, the breeder, or the person who is raising that dog um, has a t-shirt that you wear at the kennel. You could put that in you know, as, a, as a piece of the bedding um, because it's going to help that dog know that that crate is the safe place during transport. Um, if the puppy has, is going to a person, go ahead and have them send you two or three t-shirts of their own that that puppy can be crating with while it's there. Um, before it's ready for transport. So it's having uh, a fresh shirt the day it goes into the crate. So they're learning this uh, smells. The other thing that we want to do is to check the weather. Um, you've got your temperatures that they're in between and uh, regulations that are a one size fit all sometimes isn't the best thing. There are Northern and Arctic breeds of dogs who would much prefer to stay on a nice cold floor but at the same time, they don't want out in the heat either. So um, you've got short haired dogs, long haired dogs. And, and so you can't pick the day and the temperature exactly perfect for any of them. But if you know you're shipping today and that it's gonna be really warm and let's go ahead and maybe not keep it 
to the high to the coldest regulated point in your kennel that day you know or the week prior to that puppy shift shipping if it's within the safe area and you're still within your temperature areas turn the temperature up just a little bit for those animals that are fixing to prepare for transport if you can separate them that far if you know it's going to be a little cooler day go ahead and work on maybe dialing the temperature down closer but still within your regulated temperatures so that they're not having a sudden heat shock um, or something like that but still keep it between your regulated areas so check your weather know where, where the puppies or dogs are going and what's happening with them um, and adjusting your thermostat, that's, that's just what I was just talking about, um, but take it that desired direction just a little bit one way or the other to make sure that those animals are starting to, to acclimatize just a little bit. So um, let's talk about um, having the right bedding. We talked about that a little bit, um, but you want a puppy something that can nestle if it's cold and you know maybe not as much nesting material when it's a little bit warmer but um, I think the regulations and correct me if I'm wrong I'm not the specialist on this but it, it says um, uh, absorbent material or mesh and I'm assuming it could be a combination of that um, an absorbent material below um, a mesh resting pad Maybe put a little bit of the paper material or a blanket on top of that if you wanted to, and it would probably be fine. The, but you could also, they've got some of those now cool pads that you can put in the freezer and have those cool pads and some of them are actually an absorbent material that you can put under those mesh pads. So if you were kind of, eh, it might be a little warmer, it's not an embargo day but it could be close to that margin think about that um, i've talked to a couple people um, in the room they've said yeah you can put food and water on the crate and is that correct okay you can put food and water on the crate but also if you know it's going to be a warmer day freeze that bottle of water and put it on the top of the crate so that you know it is going to cause a little bit more of a cool from that at least in one spot in the crate and we did talk um, to somebody last night who mentioned um, uh, those crates sitting directly on a hot surface, okay? Uh, we want, maybe you do want a little bit of a barrier or something uh, under that puppy um, to create less of a heat stress if it was got set down on the tarmac for a couple of seconds before it's picked up and put into the, into the cargo plane. So those were some very good thoughts of, of what uh, some folks were, have been talking about. So let's talk about food and water and familiar and frozen. We talked a little bit just now about the frozen, but let's talk about the familiar. During COVID, I heard uh, several, well, let's say unpleasant stories about puppies that could no longer go by air. Everybody was scrambling and trying to find transportation to get puppies to different areas. And uh, one particular breeder, she did her part, she did her due diligence, and she packaged food, she packaged water, she wanted the puppies to stay on their food, the, and the transporter did, told them, yep, we'll make sure your puppy gets this food. Well, when it got to where it was going, two and a half days later, and they handed it to the new puppy buyer, the new puppy buyer said the puppy drank like it hadn't drank in a month, and the package of food had never been open. So that made everybody really upset. Um, puppy was stressed. Puppy was not doing as great as it should have been. It made for an unhappy customer. And, and this kind of brings up another story that I'm gonna relay real quick. Um, tell your customers who are transporting dogs that if the customer insists on the transportation and making that arrangement, give them a checklist of what has to be followed if they wanna pick the transporters. Um, we've seen a couple of instances where, and this was another dog breeder, that the transport driver drove into the driveway and the puppy buyer had arranged it. The puppy buyer wanted to arrange it. And they looked at it and it looked like Cheech and Chong coming down the dirt road and the smoke rolling out the windows. And the puppy buyer goes, mm -mm. the puppy seller said, mm, my puppy ain't getting in that car. And because there was no, um, it's what the puppy buyer had, had arranged and, and the 
puppy raiser had the right to say no. And she refunded the money and that puppy did not go where they thought it was gonna go. So that's just kind of on uh, what's familiar and frozen. And if the puppies are used to being housed a certain way, you know, let's, let's add some sounds to the kennel. Let's add some noise to the kennel. Let's do some noises that they might hear during transportation. Let's get them acclimated to maybe the sounds of a jet engine, maybe the sound of some road noises, maybe the sounds of some of the other things that are happening in their world. So I don't want you to get all tied up in knots about what I'm saying. I want you to know that uh, we're working smarter, not harder, but we still work hard. And that does make all the difference in the world in uh, how we do our jobs and what we're able to do. And so don't think I'm crazy. Uh, when I first walked out onto the uh, dog world and was talking to um, some of the dog breeders, they thought, yep, that's a crazy lady. She doesn't know how dogs work. She doesn't know how to raise them. She doesn't know what we're doing out here. Um, but let me tell you, I've seen some amazing changes in the dog world over the years. And um, uh, puppies can arrive cleaner, neater, when they start learning some of these things. This is a whelping box right here. This is actually from a dog breeder over in Ohio. And there's actually a radiant floor heat right here. And these little guys are not in the center, which tells me the floor is on and maybe it's a little warmer than they wanted to be. So they moved off to the edges. Okay, but right here, there's a little door cut. There's a piece of plastic, marine plastic right here and a door that goes through here. Here's their food and here's their water. This is little bits of puppy poop. These little bulldog puppies are probably only about five weeks old, maybe six. But what these little guys are showing me is that, and then there's a piece of plexiglass over the top of this. You can see the three hinges right here where that hinges. So that mom can't get into their special gruel and food. Then I put this picture and leave it this way, but I would put the food and water on the same side because puppies don't like to poop where their food and water is. And if it's between it, it doesn't make, they have to choose. But if the food and water was on one side, it would help be more helpful to have a, a, a litter box over here. But these little puppies are actually holding it, walking through and peeing and pottying over there. So that's one of the things that helps the puppies already learning to become latrinal, which will help them in the transportation of, of when they're getting on the transport trucks and learning that, you know, eliminate before I get, get on that truck. So weaning is the friend of the dog breeder. It is the friend of the transporter. And just like I said earlier, training the puppies to eat in a crate is really, really easy. Um, one of the things I do with the puppies when I start weaning them is I will take my bowl and I'll walk over there and I'll tap two or three times on it and say, here, puppy, puppy, puppy. And the puppies, you know, they really don't know what's going on. They're like, oh yeah, whatever. And then yeah, I set the bowl down and I'll take the puppies and generally I'll do them one at a time. I'll put, put, pick them up and I'll take the gruel in the spoon and I will let them lick it off of it. And puppies at that age really can't stand up well and they just kind of sit down. So what I taught that puppy was a human animal interaction that those puppies are learning human animal bonding and that, that I'm, the, I, I'm a good food source. And so they've also learned an exercise to sit down uh, for that food or for that tree. And so the next day when I do that, you know, I may come in and go, here, puppy, puppy, and tap on that pen, on that, on that bowl. Um, what, and like Pablo's theory, when the, they hear the bell ring, the dog starts slobbering, the puppies start doing the same thing. They're getting excited to hear my voice because they know food is coming. So then I start doing that and putting individual bowls in a crate. And when I put them in the individual crates, they're very happy to eat. And I can go back through once they're all in there, get them in a crate, shut the door, they've eaten. Then just as soon as they're done, I will open the doors, let them out, put them over in a litter box. And within minutes, they're learning to pee and potty, but they're also learning to hold it. So these are some things that really makes it really easy for a dog breeder and to start the crate training. Now, a happy puppy is a tired puppy, and a tired puppy is one that's gotten to play. And uh, when 
I do the crate training, separation starts happening, but I'll do them like two puppies in a crate together, then one puppy by itself. And then uh, when, when it happens again and they're by themselves, one of the things that I do is I'll give them a high reward, high value treat to get those guys to be able to start um, getting in there and laying down. And I say those high value reward treats for when they're in the crate and spend a few minutes in there and just shut them in there and let them chew on that bone and relax. And it doesn't take but a few minutes and it's easy to do that when you're cleaning your litter box. So if I'm cleaning my litter box and they're not under my feet and they're all in a crate, your life at the airport just got easier. Your life during transport of these animals got easier because they're used to being in there. And if, they're, uh, if you've let those puppies out to run and play before they got in the crate, they're gonna be tired. So the number one rules, and practice makes perfect, the number one rule, what's the key to success? When to practice, use high value rewards, some crate games, time matters, don't stall out, what words to use, shut the door and the big reversal. So we're gonna cover those real quick. So the keys to success are to stay calm yourself. When that puppy is at its worst and it is crying, and you are just about to pull your hair out because you can't even think to get your paperwork done or you can't think which exit to take because it's screaming in your ear, the key is to remain calm and quiet because if you yell at the puppy, you just joined in in making pack noise. And if you yell and you're excited, they're going to think, oh, it must be bad. I should be yelling and getting excited. Even she's upset about this. So keep, keep calm, keep quiet, keep consistent, and keep in mind that their crate is their safe place. And if we can teach them early that this is their safe place, then um, you, you'll be all right. Um, so, but the one thing to, to never ever do is to yell at a, a screaming puppy. And number one, the other number one rule is to never go back to a screaming puppy. If a puppy is screaming, you don't wanna walk over to the little guy and go, Oh, it's all right. It'll be fine. What did you just do? You just reinforced that it is terrible. It's awful to be in there. And, it, you know, and especially don't let it out when it's screaming. If it even for a half a millisecond goes, ah, 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 that's your opportunity. Use that half of the millisecond to go, yes, that was quiet for just as half a second. And then See if you can get it to take that second breath and to get its breath because you want to then expand on that time that it took that breath and the longer breath. Sometimes just a matter of turning your back on a puppy that's screaming or just when it takes that breath, yes, and put your hand down to it and then step back. When it starts screaming, turn your back to it then turn back around to it. A lot of times that's all it takes is just a little bit of reassurance. And especially if it's a puppy that's had some crate training, it's going to be okay and it'll stay, it'll calm down and get quiet. But don't, it, you know, you want to let a quiet puppy out. If it's quiet for three seconds, open it and yes, and it can come out and then extend that time. So those are some things um, that, that in the training and the practice. So when do we practice? We practice when uh, the puppy's fired up? No. We practice when that puppy's been allowed to run around, to run out and play, um, when it's had, um, and keep it in short amounts of time so that we're practicing. And you also use those high value treats to be successful for it and make sure that the puppy wins. You know, you can't just keep on trying to expand it all at one time period. No puppy's training session should be any longer than five minutes. And a lot of people go, oh, just one more time. You did so good. Let's do the next time. If you let the puppy win, when it just had just a half a second of a win, try it again later that afternoon and it'll have a three second win. And then tomorrow morning, it'll have a 10 second win. Win and, and it just grows very, very quickly. But the thing you cannot do is you can't stall out, okay? You can't stall out with these puppies. Um, and we're gonna use, like I said, high value treats. 
Um, hard crunchy treats aren't always real high value. A lot of dogs don't like those. You want something that the dog really wants and, and likes if you're gonna use treats. And we're gonna use crate games to teach the puppies to get into the crates. Um, you can use uh, just by tossing a treat in, they'll go into the kennel or crate and then shut the door, let them stand there when they're quiet and then open the door and you can throw a treat across the room the other direction and let them go get the treat the other direction. And these are just some fun things that are gonna teach puppies how to be friendly and social and interact. Um, but save those really good hard shoe toys for in the, in the crate. And again, time matters. Short amounts of times, not longer than five minutes. Keep it short. And if you get a win for two seconds, then extend it to three seconds. If you get a three second win, 10 seconds, but don't stall out because dogs are really good manipulators. They can wrap you right around that little tiny toenail and you, I see it all the time. Dog comes in the doggy door. The other dog won't quite come in. Well, he's afraid of the doggy door. Well, man, maybe he's not afraid of that doggy door. Maybe he's trained you that when he gets right to the, edge of the carpet, you'll give him the treat. You didn't make him come in all the way, all the way in the doggy door. So he trained you to give him a treat when he wasn't all the way in. So there's a com kind of a, a, a working relationship that you have to know when you're being played by the dog. And see, it happens a lot. So we are going to shut the door. We are going to have absorbent material. Um, unfortunately, during transit, they can't have extra toys and play things in there with them. But, um, you know, if they had um, a dent to chew or something um, with their food and water in the time period before, that makes it fun. That makes it fun. And they're already worn out. So... What words to use? Um, we're painting a picture here and you don't have to say a word at all when you start crate training these puppies and dogs. And one of the great things is um, dogs learn body language and they're way better at body language than you and I are. Um, I can simply just look at my dog and go, and they know oh, they'll drop their head. If I just give them the, the you know, how many of your dad at the dinner table when you were a kid. Think about the look your dad gave you because you're like playing in your food. They gave you, or what are you doing today? You know, dad looked at you. Dad, dad has that look or the mom look, okay? Dogs know those mom looks. And um, so you can use words like crate, kennel up, night, night, bedtime. Um, you know, get in your box. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can use. But in the beginning, you don't have to use any word at all, just the motion towards it. The throwing of the treat becomes the motion in. And sometimes the less words we use, the better, because then our dogs are more in tune to us and you're not trying to bribe them with treats. Um, I don't use a lot of treats, um, but uh, I, I do use a lot of body language. And again, Increase your time sooner than later, because if you don't, you'll stall out and the dogs learn to manipulate that way. So the big reversal is we've, we've given them treats, we've gotten them in there, we've you know, worked to get them in there um, a little bit at a time. And uh, it's been something that's been a lot of fun teaching the dogs, but um, then you get to the point where you reward them when they get out, but you don't make a big deal of it when they get out because that's like coming home to the dog that has separation anxiety. When you have a dog that has separation anxiety and you come home and, oh, I was gone all day. It was terrible, wasn't it? You were here all by yourself. You just told the dog it was terrible. It, it was terrible. You told him that. So you come home, you put your purse down, you put your keys down, you maybe go to the restroom yourself, maybe go to the cabinet, go to the refrigerator. Oh, okay, it's time for you to go out now. Just nonchalantly open the crate, let the dog out, let them out the door. That will keep their energy level low and they won't be stressed. The dog that's um, that got separation anxiety will be much better. And so when you do the big reversal, it's the same thing. You don't make a big deal that you let the puppy out because it's not a big deal. It's something that should be normal and that they're used to. So the bottom line is low stress travel 
and transportation makes for healthier, happier puppy and definitely happier customers when we get our puppies um, back there to, to them. And hopefully it makes the transportation um, for all of you guys much uh, more enjoyable as well. On the receiving end, when people are bringing puppies in, on the cleaning end during the travel, and when the puppies are getting there on their final destination. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions? All right, just as a reminder, if you have a question for Stacy in the room, please raise your hand. If you have a question virtually, put it in the Q&A session and Karen will ask it. Hi, retired AKC professional handler here. <laughs> Still in recovery, so I know who you are. Um, working breeds. Um, one of the things I noticed on the AKC website and also being a member of the AKC community for my entire life, started junior handling when I was nine. Um, I think it would be really nice for the AKC to maybe suggest very strongly that breeders and puppy buyers only use USDA licensed transporters. And then in addition, I would highly recommend that the AKC also put on their website that they should also use IPOTA members. So members who are not only USDA class H transporters, but are also members of the International Pet Animal Transportation Association, just because there's even more checks and balances and more standards and a better way. I see a lot of breeders, you know, on at the dog shows and everything using unlicensed transporters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge problem in our AKC community. And I, I think it would be really great if we could get IPOTA's name out there with AKC more. And thank you for those comments. Um, I did write two different articles during the COVID time period, one in the, at the beginning and one after that, after uh, the initial uh, influx of transporters and, and all that is mentioned and a big old line of a checklist. And there's been several articles. So they are, they are on the website. You just got to Google transportation USDA. And I'm actually put one of the links up to one of the articles. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's why I said sharing the word from what we're learning here today with other people is definitely the way to do it, to, to help get that out. And I will mention it back to the office. Okay, Karen, we have any virtual questions? No virtual questions. We have any additional questions in here? So a lot of the breeders start weaning about six weeks. When would you start your training? Um, I actually start the litter box training at about three weeks. And I actually use a cake pan with litter in it. And when the puppies are still in the nest and they're still with mom and nursing, um, when I am picking them up and looking at them on a daily basis and they're laying there asleep nicely, I'll just pick them up at two or three and put them over into the litter box and then encourage them to potty over there. And it, uh, the next thing I move up to is I can buy a um, tray that goes under like a hot water tank. It's round or you can get them in squares. Um, even sometimes the, the bottom tray of a dog crate, the plastic ones, you can buy those replacement ones at some of the supply stores. And um, I'll put that over there and it's got an even lower lip when they're a little more mobile on their own. And then they can get over into it. I've got a lot of kennels now. They don't use anything for it. They've just put some uh, material, some uh, um, litter material in the corner of the pen and the puppies will make their way over to it. If you're picking them up and waking them up and setting them over to it, by the time they can wiggle and wobble and get around, they're actually making their way over to it and starting to be latrinal on their own. And then a lot of the dog breeders I work with will open the doggy doors and move that material outside. And they're using the material to start the puppies into dog door training before they're even going. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Probably a stupid question, but I'll ask it. Uh, so in a kennel, in like a transportation kennel where animals are coming in and out and we have to rewash bedding, is there any particular detergent that we should avoid or use or? Uh, well, just for, and, and a lot more veterinarians in this, in this room, um, I'm not, um, 
but from what I'm told, don't use products that have soul in it, S-O-L, on the end of it, like Lysol and stuff like that. Some of those S-O-L products um, um, are maybe not this, the, the products you want to use, um, but there are some um, Odor Pet and a few other um, products out there that um, work pretty well for, for odor removal or for um, um, neutralization of odors that, that will help rather than just covering up odors. Okay, next question. Hi, um, so I'm asking a professional basically. Um, so we've seen the shredded papers being used and we also understand that dogs will try and avoid the sleeping and sorry, the eating area away from their potty area. But in terms of a small crate, with the, with the duration of travel internationally, we sort of like, you know, just bear with it. We have them just hold it in pretty much. But um, is, there, is there something better that we could try? And in terms of shredded paper, is it, is it, is it good? Because I, I find it a mess to clean up. And I don't really think it absorbs or, you know, makes anything cleaner. <laughs> Now, having, having cleaned up lots and lots of dog crates over the years, um, it is a messy job. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing your um, PPE, personal protection equipment, your gloves, and, and it is best to wear a mask, especially when you're crawling in dog crates and in tight confined areas and uh, slosh and wash and all that stuff kind of happening. You want to make sure that um, you are, um, I've seen some breeders are using cardboard shredded, and you know, they may be getting their crates coming in big cardboard boxes and then they're putting that into different types of shredders. Um, I've seen them um, in, in some round shapes, some square shapes. There's a distributor of pet products that's up in Pennsylvania that's actually selling it by the box because he gets so much um, cardboard in. And he's saying he's liking it very, a, lot, a lot because he's not getting the um, ink staining that might be on some of the shredded paper. But anything that's paper, I've had veterinarians tell me that it's not gonna hurt them if they eat a little bit of it because it's just gonna, you know, and they're probably not gonna eat a lot of it. Um, I do find that the short cross cut shredded paper is a lot, lot more messier than the ones that are normally about six or eight inches, but the ones that do the commercial size with a whole big long string of them, if you get that kind of paper, tear it into bits so that it, the puppies don't get tangled up in it. So, but there are other commercially made products out there that are for litter and absorbent for, for animals. Um, the only one that was, was made by uh, Purina and it was uh, pet safe. Uh, you can find it still every once in a while, but I'm not sure if, if they're even still making that. Or, or daily news is what it was called, I think. Okay, we probably have time for one more question if anyone else has one. Karen, any virtually? Okay, thank you very much, Stacey. Thank you for choosing me to be here. I appreciate it.